Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. We are dedicated to creating a capable, diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, every way that you can define diversity into the education, economic mobility, and leadership pipeline. Every month we meet here with Dr. Paul Miller and a variety of different experts from his wide, amazing circle of leaders. And we also have several other equity sessions, one for higher education called Get Comfortable Being Uncomfortable. We have one for STEM, which is actually happening tomorrow with um, Paula Garcia Todd and her STEM experts. And then the end of this month, we'll have our health equity team with a number of different African-American medical leaders. All of these sessions, especially this month for Black History. So thank you so much for joining us and please mark your calendars in advance that June 22nd, 23rd, 24th will be live in Denver. We'll have a number of different pre-conferences on the 22nd. Our opening dinner, which is the Inclusive Leader Awards will be Wednesday night and the conference will be Thursday and Friday. Friday afternoon, we'll have something called Industry Marketplace Career Exploration Arena apprenticeship, internship, and job fair. So we uh, very much look forward to seeing all of you in person. It's wonderful to see you each month like this, but it's not the same. <laughs> so we are looking forward to being live with everybody. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce one of our key leaders, Dr. Paul Miller, and he is a principal at Green Tech High. He's just about ready to launch another school. Maybe he'll share that with you, but he is uh, one of the people that we honor in our leadership team uh, who make up our um, African-American uh, inclusive leaders at Global Minded. So Paul, welcome and welcome to all your guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And yes, we are in the process of trying to open an elementary school in Rochester, New York for all boys. Uh, we're going to start with uh, pre-K and kindergarten, and we're going to grow them up and make sure we eliminate some of those learning gaps and provide a, a different type of education. So uh, definitely look out for that. We're trying to open up in fall of 23. Uh, we're just going through all the whole approval process. So uh, good things coming with that. Thanks for, for uh, mentioning that, Carol. Um, I do have a very... Uh, interesting group of individuals here. I say interesting uh, lightly. Uh, I, have a, I have a great group here today, uh, a wealth of knowledge, expertise, and some different backgrounds of education. And so uh, usually, just traditionally, what we do is give everyone about 60 seconds to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what do you do, why you're here, all that good stuff. Uh, the first person I see is uh, as Michael Logan, tell us tell us a little bit about, yeah, I went to you first. Good <laughs> sir, How you doing? Thank you for inviting me, Paul. My name is Michael Logan. Um, I've been an educator for 25 years. Um, I've taught in the New York City School Districts, and I also um, taught in actually prisons. Um, right now, um, I work at a place called ResCare, and what we do is we um, educate um, and we job train individuals that are on social service, uh, social service, which is welfare, to go out into the job force and um, get jobs. Um, I'm here, I'm here because, um, you know, there, there's a lot of diversity and a lot of disparity in, in educating, especially educating young black males and, uh, and young black females. Um, and when we talk about and uh, diversity and inclusion, um, a lot of people don't understand what diversity and inclusion means. Um, it doesn't mean uh, mainstream education. It means that education that's tailored to the, the underclass. And I guess we're going to be talking about that as we go along. Thank you. Uh, Michael is also a member of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated and uh, uh, is a leader of the New Tau chapter. So I just had to mention that. So Brent, <laughs> knows, Brent knows he's in presence of greatness. I just need Brent to understand that. Um, Dr. McKinney Beck, same thing. Give us uh, 60 seconds. Tell us who you are. What do you do? Uh, why do you do it? All that good stuff. Hi, everyone. My name is McKinney Beck, and um, I've always wanted to teach. Education was just always in my blood. Um, I taught from, um, I've taught 
kindergarten, um, fifth grade, but really fifth grade. I um, and middle school, I got a, um, I have an MSED in secondary education. So I I taught for a little while, um, student taught, and um, high school and middle school, um, and then I went straight through the PhD and. Um, when I got out um, and I wanted to to um, teach in teacher ed programs, folks were like, "Well, you don't have enough um, teaching experience in the classroom to 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 teach future teachers." So now I'm in I'm at RIT and um, I'm actually doing what I love. I'm in sociology, so I'm incorporating education into um, the things that I talk about, but also looking at um, just inequality and equi and inequ inequity. Um, from a larger and, and broader scale. So I'm still in education, just not in K-12. Got you. Um, I, we're glad to have your uh, higher education perspective today. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Rita Carol Gaither, same, oh. same, same questions. Tell us who you are, what do you do, why you do it? Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I am one of two sets of twins, 15 months apart, and we were counted out of education before we even got started. I come from Rome, New York, which is a very, very small town and was steered away from going to a four-year college. And so I started out at a community college that was very unassuming at the time, the Fashion Institute of Technology, which is pretty renowned now, and went from there all the way up to a PhD. And I'm just thrilled because the established said, said it could not be done. I was raised in an alcoholic home. I'm very transparent. I've started a nonprofit organization called Pearl Resources. And that organization was started because there were so many gaps in delivery and for resources for the students that I taught. And students need their basic needs. So we started that organization and was able to change, close a gap in attendance and so on and so forth. So I'm thrilled to be here. I am a lifelong educator because I believe there's still a lot of work to be done. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Brent Mitchell, give us, give us a little bit. Hey, nothing wrong with saving a good Sigma man, best for last. I appreciate you, Dr. Miller. Uh, I'm Brent Mitchell. I am in year 22 of education. My original background is Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, I do uh, tons of work for charter schools throughout the Southeast. I'm very uh, heavily rooted in Arkansas as well as Texas. I also run a nonprofit in my grandfather's name, who was my first teacher. Uh, he was a high school English teacher. My grandmother was a fourth grade teacher. So I knew pretty early on I was going to be an educator. I was president of Teachers of Tomorrow in high school as well as elementary. So I knew I was going to be in the role I'm in. I just figured I was going to go to the NFL first, uh, like most of our black boys. It didn't quite work out. So I, I got a chance to go to school, get some degrees. And here I am uh, excited about being a child of color for 40 plus years, so. <laughs> Good stuff. All right, thank you everybody, I appreciate that. So I'm gonna start with an easy question and we'll throw it out. Uh, so who, am, and I'm gonna come back to you, Brent, because you started and you said your grandfather was your first educator. So who or what influenced you to become an educator? Like, tell us a little more why he influenced you or if there was anyone else you wanna talk about. And, and the second part of the question is, why isn't education sexy anymore as a profession? Because it, it, it's, it, it used to be sexy. Like, you know, to be an educator was like, oh, this, I'm gonna be a teacher, lawyer, doctor. Now people don't say, I'm gonna be a teacher. Uh, you know, that's not, not as sexy as a statement anymore. So who influenced you and, and why is it not sexy anymore? I, I'll go backwards. Um, I remember uh, when I was teaching, I was my first year teaching, I was also bartending. And my checks from bartending were way more than my teacher checks. And so I think it's not sexy anymore because financially, I mean, you go to school roughly to be in $100,000 worth of debt to come out and make $50,000 a year. And, and, and so it's just not appealing financially for some. And I think that the support you get from those who try to teach within those first three years and quit, is just a tough sale to get people to stick to it. Uh, how I got into it honestly was, I grew up in that type of house. So education for me growing up, I had issues with my, my mom was drug addicted too. So I stayed with my grandparents and my grandparents were heavy education. They were heavy 
HBCU, this is what you do. You go to school, get your degree, you come back and you have everybody that looks like you. Uh, that mindset only truly exists with those who were raised like that. And so I'm far and few in between. Uh, I want to send a huge shout out to my first male teacher. Mr. Henry Nesby was my first male teacher. I didn't even know men taught school until I got to fifth grade. Uh, Mr. Nesby made me speak correctly, sit correctly, present myself correctly. Uh, he still teaches to this day. He was a, a tremendous impact on me because I just thought, you know, that I thought you just kind of went to work, paid bills and, and, and ate with your family on Sunday. So I never really had that true educational male influence because my grandfather was always traveling and working and doing other things. So I didn't really know what education looked like really until I got to fifth grade. So Mr. Nesby, at that time it was 60 because you know he had the curl, he had the sports car. He wore the Miami Vice suit every day. He was, sexy, so he, was, he was that guy. I wanted to be like him. And so I knew when I got to school, after I got through scoring touchdowns, that was going to be my role. Good stuff. I, I, you know, I'm going to kind of give everybody a crack at this. So Dr. Gaither, what, yeah. what, do, you, what do you think? Yeah, I was a store owner, entrepreneur. And uh, some of the girlfriends that I had that taught at Edison Tech back in the 80s, I'm dating myself, uh, convinced me to be their substitute. And so I did that for about two years and they said, what are you doing? You need to convert your education into a teaching degree. And so the rest is history. Uh, they babysat, my husband was traveling overseas at the time and I had three children. I drove three nights a week to Oswego to obtain my teaching certificate. I also, they, they also saw promise in me, gave me a scholarship gave me a stipend. And uh, it was, uh, there's a little saying that sheep beget sheep. Uh, it was other educators who convinced me to take the step and to go into education full time. And I'm just so happy that I did it. So, you know, it's interesting. So, and I'm gonna keep going to ask them in a second, but it was interesting, you both alluded to other educators influenced you, influencing you to want to be an educator. I guess where where where's the gap coming? Like, why isn't it as strong as it used to be? Like, uh, like the two people that influence both of you to want to be educators, it, it's for whatever reason it's not transcending because we have shortages. We don't have the same amount of people wanting to be educators. Um, do you guys, either Brent or Dr. Gaither, have any? I would like to add something that I forgot about. We had a powerful organization in Rochester in the 80s and 90s called the Bear Organization. And that was run by African-American uh, educators. And we supported one another. I can't tell you what happened to the organization, but that is an organization that kept African-American teachers together. It was called the Bear Organization. And we met, we met uh, weekly, we paid dues. Uh, we need those organizations back. So, so I'm gonna come back to that thought. I'm gonna keep going and and ask Dr. Beck. So, so same question originally, um, as far as how, what made you influence you want to be an educator, and why is it just not education not sexy anymore? Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about that, you know, um, and I really, I really don't know. I, I don't know why why it isn't sexy. I, I remember um, I was telling my students this, that when I wanted to be a teacher, I wanted to teach because we used to, my teacher used to write on the chalkboard with the chalk and you know they used to have their hand like that and they would write. And I just thought that was so cool to write on the chalkboard. And maybe, I don't know. And, and now it's not as fun to teach because you don't have, I mean, you have whiteboards and you have all this other technology stuff, but you just don't have all the, you know, um, I don't know, it just one of those, maybe just teaching was just simpler back then, um, maybe less standards, less, um, you know, um, just hoops to jump through to become a teacher. Um, and, and so maybe just folks look at all of these hoops, at least for me, again, like I said from before, you know, I had all of these degrees and, and credentials. And then when it was time to, to be a teacher educator, they told me, no, because you don't have X. Yes, you have all of this, but you don't have this. And so maybe folks are just like, maybe there's, you know, and, and it's not that maybe there's not 
a, a lack of love for wanting to teach, but maybe it's just all of these other roadblocks that folks are like, well, what else is there that I can do with my, with my skills and my talents? I'm here um, because I found, I feel like I found a back door <laughs> um, and I never stopped. You know, I, I, um, it took me 10 years to find a position in higher ed after getting the PhD. And that's because I didn't give up. So I think um, it's, it's all of that stuff, you know. Oh, thank you, definitely. And, and I, I've seen some of your, your struggle over the years and you've, you've been able to find your niche in your home. And so congratulations to you. Um, uh, Brother Logan, what, what's, what's your thoughts on this? It's, it's really funny that you asked that. When I was in, um, when I was in uh, uh, sixth grade, I had a teacher. He didn't influence me to do anything but he couldn't teach. So I looked at him and I was like, yo, my man, I'm gonna tell you something. When I grow up, I'm gonna be a teacher. And I was playing with him when I said that. And I wasn't serious at all. And my life path just took me to be a, a phenomenal educator. Um, the reason why I say that is um, I grew up in the streets. I grew up in gangs. I grew up you know, in New York City. They, they, the, the teachers were, 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 the, um, were, were the gang members, the teachers were the pimps, the teachers were those people that I see every day. Um, as I got to college, I took that same mentality to college. And uh, when I got to college, I found out that, you know, these people aren't really smart. You know, they're, they're not really smart. And I began to really look at things that was hard. And I found out that I just had a knack to take things that are hard and break them down to something that's easy in a different way. Um, so that was a gift that I had. Um, so that's what brought me to this profession. And um, I started out my teaching career in elementary school and I taught all the way up to adult and in prisons. That's another story. But why isn't it sexy anymore? Because I'm gonna tell you why it's not sexy anymore. It's not sexy anymore because people, a lot of people, the majority of teachers didn't go in um, to college to become teachers. That's not what they did. They couldn't find a job when they got out and then they found out that their, their, um, their, uh, their discipline that they were in allowed them to go teach. So then um, like uh, uh, Dr. Beck said, you know, they found their little back door getting in. And then when they got in, they said, hey, I get this uh, summers off. I get this, I get that. You know, let me stay around. And teaching was not a, 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 a priority. Teaching was a secondary method of making income. And it wasn't really in, in, in their heart. In order to be a teacher, it has to be in your heart. You have to be a lifelong educator, a lifelong learner, and learn. You know, you have to be a people's person. That's why we have a lot, so many teachers struggling right now. Um, what Dr. Mitchell said, the money aspect, right? The money aspect. I went to college, I'm $100,000 in debt. And you want me to start at $40,000 a year? I got a PhD. You want me to start at $40,000 a year? That's never going to get me out of debt. And one more thing on the flip side of that, if I'm a civil service person and I'm a garbage man, Four years of being a garbage man without going to school, without going to school, I can have a house, I can have a car. And especially the kids from the ghetto, I can sell drugs. So it's not all about, it's not all about um, not being able to do it. And your question about being sexy, everything else is sexy except for being a teacher. Because teachers go through a lot. We get the kids that act up, we get this, we get this, we get this. You have to be a, a special person, a dedicated person to be a teacher or an instructor or a facilitator. Right. Okay. And just because I'm sorry. No, no. I, and, and I think that that that's kind of the point over to my next question is, so it, it's not attractive anymore. It's not something that people overwhelmingly are looking to do because of the money, because of the stress, because of the hours. So we have shortages going on. And so we'll get to the shortages of people of color in a second. But just overall, like, what what do you propose? Are there to to do things differently? Like, 
because if I think I read something recently, somewhere between 27 and 29, if we, if education doesn't change, we're going to be in a big problem because there aren't educators. There aren't people to fill the classrooms and the seats um, and not qualified people. Uh, so, and that's a whole nother story. And if we keep doing things the way we're doing, so what, what anybody chime in, any thoughts or solutions to, to this, looking at from a general scope first, and we're going to narrow down and look at uh, people of color as well. But, uh, you know, I just want to um, just say that I'm, there perhaps is a teacher shortage, but the thing is there's, there's no teacher shortage in very wealthy schools or, you know, or high demand schools. These, these shortages are really in urban schools. So, uh, you know, you know, this, this notion of that there's a teacher shortage, I, you know, I really, I, I always push back on that um, because there are teachers, but they're just, you know, the good teachers are, are, are moving out of, you know, and moving into other, um, other districts away from um, where, there, where there is really a strong need. Uh, teachers of color are not really being given contracts. They're giving long-term substitution uh, opportunities, but no teaching contracts. I have friends that have been long-term subs for five, six, 10 years. That is ridiculous. Uh, young people of, people of color, why aren't they hiring these people? Why aren't they hiring these teachers? Right. Well, I think. Go ahead. I, I think that the um, the the pathway to becoming a teacher and the way that the system is set up. I'm talking about you know certi mm -hmm. certification and when you get there. I know in New York City, you know, you got to go through all of these different ho hoops and and things like that. But in order to become a substitute teacher, you don't have to. Right now, substitute teachers in New York City get paid $5,000 every two weeks because there's a COVID incentive. They get $5,000. So if I'm getting $5,000. <laughs> so, so, I'm going to come so, sub in New York. <laughs> so, so, so if I'm getting $5,000 to sub in New York, I'm getting paid more than a regular teacher. You know, so, and, and to your point, um, Dr. Beck, and, and, uh, 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 Dr. Carroll, everybody can't come into the to, to, in, into the ghetto to teach. Everybody cannot. I used to I used to um, mentor teaching fellows. They used to come in, and they were gone in three days because you. you I'm a firm believer in I can't go to a suburban school and teach. I can't do that. I won't make it because I'm used to dealing with where I grew up at. And those kids that are hard headed, that get in trouble and all of that, I can teach them, you know? So to your point, uh, Dr. Beck, when you see these teachers going to these schools and, and, and I'm sure Dr. Miller's gonna go into this, everybody that's black, we don't share all the same experiences. As I'm from the ghetto, Somebody else that's that's black may not be, and they may gravitate toward that school where there's uh, predominantly uh, European students, or they may just want to go there because it's an easier ride. It's a challenge working in our schools, and, and you gotta love you gotta love what you're doing to work in an inner city school. Right. So 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 like let's talk about that the, the hiring piece. So Brent, do you do you intentionally hire black people? of color, like why or why not? Do you, like I'm putting you on the spot. So it, so a black man walks in your office, are you trying to get a brother a job or, or are you, or is there other criteria? Talk to me, what does that look like and why? Well, since we're having a courageous conversation, I'm gonna go ahead and be honest. If a black man walk in my office and he qualified, he got the job, unless he messed up an interview. Uh, I think I'm as intentional as NFL owners are with their coaching selections. And so what I control, I do my best to control accordingly because the schools I serve all look like me and I need to give them a chance to have a Mr. Nesby or a Mrs. Nesby in their life because that kid could be my superintendent for my grandkids one day, who knows? And so I am intentional. I do attend HBCU job fairs to recruit teachers. Um, I also think that when you're in environments just, just being transparent, I think that people that look like me would come to me looking for a job. 
And, you know, it's just, it's, I don't, I don't even think it's racial. I just think it's something we do human nature. Like we, we tend to flock to those that look like us and, and environment. And so when I'm at job fairs, I get a lot of applications from brothers and sisters seeking to get their foot in the door. And I do my very, very best to help them with those opportunities. Um, the 14 schools I serve from my nine to five are all at least 87% socioeconomic disadvantaged, uh, all black and brown kids. And so we try to give the demographics reflective of the, those that work for us. No, I, I, definitely, I, de I definitely concur with that. Yeah, I, um, because at the end of the day, you know, I too look for uh, people who look like the demographic that they're serving, but I also want qualified people. Um, so if you're a person of color, you the key word is you still have to be qualified um, because I think it's almost worse when we put somebody who looks like them in front of them and they don't have a clue. Um, so it's almost damaging. But uh, a qualified brother or, or sister, I, I definitely try to put them in a position because there's so many times we're not in a position to hire somebody who looks like them. And so it's an opportunity to uh, to level the playing fields, but also looking for the most qualified person. Because uh, where I'm at, uh, un unfortunately, um, there aren't always a lot of candidates of color and especially not a, a lot of candidates of men of color. And so uh, to me, the next step is we have to teach uh, we have to teach people about their un implicit bias and break down walls and teach them how to build relationships so that they have the ability to uh, teach students and students can learn because we don't always have that opportunity. So Brother Logan, what, what, what was your take on this? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm gonna be very transparent when, 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 when everybody here, when you say qualified, when you say a qualified person can come in and they have to be qualified, um, what does that look like? What does qualification look like? Um, because we all have implicit biases, right? And I'm gonna be transparent with something right now. So, you know, um, if I came to you and said, um, um, I'm a felon and I wanna work in your school, what would you say? Well, what would you I've, say? I've hired I'm felons who, have, who can pass no, no, the No, no, hold on. Hold, yeah. hold, I know yeah. about you, uh, but what would you say, Dr. Brent? I would ask you if you could pass a black background check. Okay, and, and you know that question right there, can you pass a background check, is uh, a really a an illegal question. Oh, That's I get an illegal it. I get question, it. right? right, right? right, right. But right. what I'm saying to you, just by saying that, just by coming to you and saying, hey, I'm a felon, but I, I want to teach your kids, right? So... If you already, Dr. Miller talked about the implicit bias, right? That bias kicks in, oh, the word felon, oh, this, 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 it automatically gives you a strike against you. But, and I'm gonna say this, you're looking at one of the most successful felons that you have ever seen. One of the most successful. So if we had this conversation and you never knew I was a felon, and if I would've came out and was like, listen, what, what's your name? My name is Michael Logan. I'm a felon. It, it, it kicks into something else. So now if I'm qualified or not, if I'm qualified or not, that pushes me to the side. So that's why when I, when you said qualification, I got every degree in the, in, in the part, I just didn't get a doctor degree because I didn't want it. But you know, I work for one of the majors and I'm a, I'm a supervisor of one of the major companies um, in, in New York City. I actually run the department of for two boroughs. We we got to be careful when you say you qualified and what does qualification mean? And like Dr. Beck said, you know, she had all the qualification in the world and they turned around and were like, oh, you can't be a teacher because you didn't go take this course. So mm -hmm. we, we have to be careful. So, so Dr. Gaither, Dr. Beck, um, if you guys are in positions to hire, hire black, do you or, or not? And especially, I'm going to go to Dr. Beck first because uh, you're at a PDI and a predominantly white institution. Uh, so uh, a PW, whatever it is, you know, what I, everybody knows what I mean, right? <laughs> so you're at one of those places, which is, is it's a, a tremendous learning institution, but where does it come in for you? How does that happen or influence? You know, I was gonna actually give the floor to Dr. Gaither and then I can, and I can speak right after. Go sure, ahead. sure. We, we have hired um, 
are primarily African American. We had um, a tutoring uh, business through No Child Left Behind, uh, where we, I think we had about 100 teachers, about 100 teachers that were teaching our students. Uh, we did have some white teachers there, but predominantly they were African American. And uh, to the point of felons, I have two former students who are fe were felons and who are principals right now. So you really can attain to uh, just about anything that you want. Uh, and they are exemplary uh, educators. So you just have to do what's best. You just have to have that innate uh, unction to be discerning, to know which candidates to select for your, your particular program. So in high, yeah, in higher ed, at this, at this level, everyone's qualified. Um, everyone has the research, everyone has the degree, you know. Um, so, um, and, and, and there's a shortage at our level as well. Um, there are in the, in the um, Department of Sociology and Anthropology, I don't know, there's, I don't know, um, maybe 10 or so of us, 12. There's only two, um, there's, I'm, I'm one of two black women and um, Dr. Dr. Kajana Crawford is mm -hmm. on her way out. She's pretty much retired. So when she leaves, there's no <laughs> hiring another one of us. I'll be the other, I'll be the only one. And even in the College of Liberal Arts, um, there's just a handful. When I say handful, it's like, you know, we could all hang out in one person's office, you know, um, just, you know, chill and, and you know, and so, um, there's a very small number of us. So, but um, at this level though, yes, there is a need for more faculty of color to teach students. Um, but when we're looking, you know, at least when, when, I'm, when folks are coming in and, and um, applying for a position and interviewing, I'm really looking at um, more than your skin color, to be honest. At this level, I'm looking at what are you bringing to the table? Um, what knowledge, you know, are you bringing in? And, or just what is your agenda when you come to teach in this space? Um, are you just going to be a black person, you know, just like a, a, a person in black skin or brown skin? Or are you bringing an agenda that understands race, that understands intersectionality, or just the ways that students are marginalized and isolated in higher ed? So at this level, I'm really looking at, um, you know, just what's your agenda, you know, and um, how do you understand your, your purpose here, your value here? And here's the thing too, right? Just like um, Michael said, you can't ask that question. You can't ask, what's your agenda? <laughs> Are you going to be here for the Black students? You can't ask that, but, um, but you kind of have to just feel folks out. And if you, and if they feel right, you know, um, there's one um, faculty, uh, she just, she was a postdoc, um, um, Katrina Overby, you know, when, when you see her research, when she's talking about just when she talks about her, her research on like on Twitter and black Twitter, um, and the need for black voices, when, when you see that coming through, you know, okay, this is one of us, we, we, we want this sister on board, we want this person on board, but when folks come with another agenda, we'll be like, mm, we need a Katrina, you know, so um, that's really what I'm looking for when, when folks are coming in and interviewing. So, so uh, along the lines, back to you, Dr. Beck, like, so how does like your institution um, provide like adequate representation for staffing or is there a plan or, or, and then you're probably gonna tell me there isn't. And they got this good person with a fancy title and they are supposed to be diversity, equity, inclusion and all that other stuff. And then there's only two black people in there. So I know all that. So like, what's your commitment? Like, what are you gonna do? How do you change it from the inside out? Like. You know, tell me more. Yeah, right. So, you know, we have all the good stuff on paper, um, courageous conversations, right? So we, we, we have all, we, we have the office. Um, these are folks who go out and, and recruit. We have a program that comes in and, um, and brings in faculty um, of color who are gonna, you know, like who go to different departments and they, and, and they um, pitch their research. So we have all these wonderful, beautiful programs um, for folks to come in. We even have a, a um, a scarf, it's called a scarf, but it's pretty much a, a out, outline where folks can go and look and see, okay, make sure that who you're, who, who, who the, the team of people that you're coming, that you're bringing in, like, if you're bringing in four people to interview, make sure that there's a woman, make sure that there's a person of color, et cetera, right? So we have all of these things that check the box um, at RIT, but 
in reality, we still don't have the folks that we need that, that that's represented um, in, you know, with students. And so um, I'm an assistant professor, right? So I'm kind of like, I don't want to say it, I'm kind of like mid-level, um, but it's when I'm in those meetings and folks are saying, well, should we hire this person and that person? It's like, we need to hire her because look at the research that she brings in, look at, you know, the work that she brings with her. Um, so my voice is very vocal. Um, when I do that. Also, we have, you know, like we bring candidates out for dinner and stuff. And I'm talking in people's ear like, so let me hear what you have to say. Let me hear. I, I want to know kind of like the background of you, you know, and, and I'm always advocating again um, in meetings. We need to push for this person. One more thing, um, you know, like one of the big discussions we had is about having a, a um, more, more faculty, you know, um, and it was like, well, do we hire one or do we hire three? And it's like hire three. You know, hire as many as you can. You can't bring one person in and, tr and try to change the culture of this predominantly white space. You need to hire folks, but you need to hire the numbers. But you know, we have these um, these um, people who talk the talk, but when you don't have the money to back that those that talk up, then it's kind of like, okay, you just take what you can get. And, and so, Dr. Gaither, do you feel like uh, children of color need educators who look like them? And you know, speaking in the line of like Dr. Beck is just sharing that they're trying to do things in the higher ed to 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 uh, make sure that there's educators who are representative. Um, but do even the higher ed do the K twelve kids do they need people of color that look like them and why why not what do you, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, I I never I won't tell you my age, but I've never had an African American a person of color as a as a professor in college or elementary school, high school, nowhere, ever, okay? And I've been doing this job long enough for over 30 years. I have my students, my students come back and find me. Mm -hmm. they okay, they, 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 come, they come back and find me. They are some of the most successful people that I know. So I know that it works. I didn't even teach in some of the uh, disciplines, the expertise that those kids went into. They went into engineering, they went into uh, physics, they went into all sorts of uh, things. I was, I hold four different teaching certifications and they come back and they find me and they tell me it is because sometimes I don't even recognize them. It's because of you that we became teachers, we became successful in life because of this one African American teacher who really was, and Dr. Miller can tell you, totally out of the box, got myself in so much trouble. Home <laughs> visits, home visits. I went to all the funerals. I went to the beauty salons, the, you know, the, the family reunions, uh, took kids when somebody told me you can't take those kids overseas. I've taken seven trips abroad with kids who had never been off their streets. All right. The last trip that we took was to Israel. Those kids and two of the kids were homeless. And two of those kids are now finishing college. So you can't tell me that it doesn't work. Those kids, every kid has been to my house. Sit down. Let's eat at the table. So you got to really, it's, it's not a job, it's not an occupation, it is a calling that I am just so proud of. So it works. I'm old enough to tell you that it works. I don't need research. It works. Right. And I, I think Dr. Gaither was important for me in that is, is the connection that you made with kids and kids were able to identify and they see someone who looks like them. And then you took it upon yourself because it is who you are to build a connection and build a relationship with them that transcended uh, just the regular school day. You know, Michael Parker asked me about you last week when I seen him on the train. He uh, he asked me about you. So uh, just a testament uh, yeah. uh, to what you do. Um, he's actually doing pretty well now. But Brent, what, you, what do you think about that, dude? Yeah, I want to I want to piggyback on that because my story is a little different. Um, and so I remember being a ninth grader in gifted and talented English class, right? had a teacher who um, pulled me out in the hallway and basically said, you have no business in this class. You won't graduate high school, et cetera. That teacher to this day has fueled me to where every degree I've ever gotten, I paid for two 
to send her a copy. And I make sure it gets delivered to the school and that she has to sign for it because she pushed me to be qualified to be her superintendent. And so I remember when I was working in that district and applying for that job, I mentioned that in my interview, probably cost me the job, but I want to make sure <laughs> that she knew uh, that she influenced me to, to go out and make sure that people like her weren't poisoning kids' minds. Mm -hmm. And so when you when you were talking about kids, my story was because that, that made me so mad. I remember going like crying as a nine, you know, I'm a little ninth grade kid from the hood. I didn't want to be in GT English, no way. They made me take the class because of my test score. And so for her to say that, and like in the middle of like my favorite, like we were doing Greek mythology, I never forget, like I wanted to be Poseidon. And so she pulled me out in the hallway and kind of blessed me real good. And I told every black teacher at that school what she said. And my grandmother was on the school board. My godmama was the assistant principal. My uncle was the coach. She didn't know who she was talking to. And so that was just a perk of, of knowing you got the right one today. And, and it's sad that she's still teaching, but, um, you know, hey, I, I do my best to make sure. I need to go get another degree so I can tell us it's been a while. I need to go pick up some coursework somewhere in New York because I can make 5000 every two weeks. Sub. <laughs> you know, what's interesting about all that, Brent, is that the one thing that I heard in there is the people that you were able to use as your references and resources were, right. were, were Black educators. And right. you had them available to you. And so they happen to be a relation. But... Uh, and like Dr. Gaither is that relation for so many kids. So, so Logan, we're like, what do you, what, what's your take on this? Um, just like with Dr. Gaither, um, I'll tell you a story, real quick story. Um, when I was teaching summer school in um, in, in in the South Bronx, um, I'm I'm as like uh, Dr. Gaither. I, I'm always in trouble because I'm doing something to help the kids. Always in trouble. But they gave me a class of kids that had IEPs and they couldn't, they couldn't really read, they couldn't really do X, Y, Z. And they were supposed to take, and we should be familiar with this, something called the RCT. You either took the English Regents or the RCT, right? And the RCT was for the kids who couldn't pass the Regents. And so I went in the classroom and I taught two classes that summer. I taught regular English and I taught, um, the uh, IEP class. So I'm teaching my IEP class and the, the, the assistant principal comes in and is like, what are you teaching them? Teaching them English. Well, you don't have to teach them all of that because they, 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 they can't read and they can't this and that. I said, who said they can't read? I said, I'm gonna teach them to pass the regions exam. Now, this is where out of the box comes from. I took the simplest book in the world, and Dr. Miller, I think I told you this one time. I took Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss and taught all the elements of English to those kids. Not only did I teach them that, I showed them, I showed them the movie and went over two other books. One, one was um, The Crucible, and the other one, um, I forgot the name of the book, but it was, um, it was a movie. So I did that and I showed them the movie. And I, you know, I explained to them what to do. They went into the regions exam because I wouldn't allow them to take the uh, RCT. Only if you fail the regions exam, you could take the RCT. The, all, the whole class, it was like 12 of them went in and they all passed the regions with green eggs and ham. So I was like, I was like, you know, our, our bias get in the way when we start saying that our kids can't learn something. Um, and, and, and my take on what we do, how we present ourselves and, and the disbelief, because some people go into teaching and they have a disbelief, right? They start living that self-fulfilling prophecy that these kids can't learn, don't want to learn. But every kid is learning something from you, whether you're teaching them or not. They're so, learning. So was there a deeper connection because they look like you? Or do you feel um, like- do you No, feel like I had, I had, I had poor- I had poor white kids, poor black kids, but I gravitated to the, you know, my implicit bias, I'm gonna be honest with you, gravitated me toward the black kids and the Latino kids. But the white, the, the couple of white kids that was in my class, they were my students. And they reaped the benefit 
of everything else everybody else was getting. So at, in that situation, you know, they they were all they all came together. So 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 I mean everybody has made some really great points with with uh, and has shared stories of of deep connections with kids who have uh, commonalities in line and who look like them. And I hear an establishing point of view that we do need more educators of color. So we also had some conversations saying, saying yes, we got teacher shortages. We have uh, shortages of teachers of color. We have, uh, we have all these issues that are systemic across the line. So you guys have this magic wand and can fix it. Uh, like what? What? What do you do, Doctor Beck? You want to fix this? You know, you the fancy college professor around there. You, you got the the big brain. What, how do you fix this? Um, you know, well, right. So we start at our our small space. You know, I think that um, we need to recognize first of all that it's more than skin color or it's more than this this student has has brown skin and I connect with them. Um, or, or even the assumption, right, that 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 skin color brings. I, I think we need to recognize what we mean by um, looking like someone. Um, you know, is that we need to recognize again the agenda. Um, if you come with the agenda that I am here for a purpose, I am here to to support, to advance, um, to, to 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 look after my students. You know, I understand that there are systems that are in place that hold them back, that there are political agendas, that there are struck all of these things. I think you need to. I think it's more than just the skin color. It's the knowledge. It's the understanding that people with who are of color bring to these spaces. And so it's, 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 it's recognizing that, that, that we have this understanding. Um, and for me, when I, when I, when, when I, so it's more than just me entering into that space at RIT, but so what I do now um, is I am, I'm on this, I, I'm actually doing research now where I'm seeing that a lot of women um, at RIT, they're in these STEM programs and they're being, um, filtered out. Not, I don't want to say filtered out, but they just get. First of all, there's very few women in STEM. Um, there's even more, right? There's even less women of color in STEM, um, and especially you know when they go to places like RIT where they want to be into engineering or computer science or any of these things, they realize year one I can't do this, and so they drop out. So um, what we so what I'm doing now is I'm actually a part of a, a, a I'm writing grants I'm doing research where I am supporting those women of color um, who feel isolated in their STEM programs and so I'm trying to write grants to help at least develop a network for them um, and I'm also just like pushing scholarship and even just you know. Um, and I'll be uh, doing professional development as well for faculty at RIT to talk about, at least think about that you have these students in your classroom and um, they're faltering and they're faltering because you're not paying attention to them because you're saying things and you're not recognizing that, that you're isolating them or that you're doing these things. So um, at my level, um, it's you know um, recognizing that there is a need for this group of folks uh, my need is um, looking at STEM women um, and seeing how can we support them more. Um, so that's my little my little niche. Uh, that that's I'm a great uh, that's a great niche and very needed. And we need more people doing that. And uh, you know, we need people to get on and support with you for that. Uh, Brent, how do you change not having enough uh, educators of color? How do we how do we get some more? Um, you know, ink in the bowl of milk. <laughs> uh, that's, do I have a magic wand or am I just, am I being realistic? What kind of answer you want me to give you? Uh, let's hear both. You got, you got 60 seconds to give me both. <laughs> 60 <laughs> seconds. All right. So uh, if I got a magic wand, I make the hip hop culture think that being educated is smart. I got rappers bragging about having degrees and, and, and how, you know, respecting women and things of that nature are cool and I necessarily have to, 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 I guess the kids call it floss. You don't have to floss to be cool. I think that you make it 
to where, you know, I, I, I talk to kids all the time and I tell them, hey, I got all the luxuries of a drug dealer, but I sleep well every night. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to let kids know that at some point you'll make enough money in this thing if you stick with it mm -hmm. to live comfortably and have everything you want in life. Realistically, I think we've got to be more aggressive in our pursuit of minority candidates and help them uh, jump over some of the hurdles. Mm -hmm. I know that the licensure is an issue here for us in Texas. Mm -hmm. A lot of my buddies that reach out can't pass certain levels of testing or they they get frustrated with the the, the being in the sub role. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I got a buddy right now who uh, probably subbed for three years and he I remember him saying this frustration. He sent me a clipping from the newspaper showing that the assistant manager at Wendy's made more than the first year teacher. And so I, I share in his frustration with that. I think that we've just got to do a better job of making it sexy just to kind of bring it back to the original topic in the beginning. And I think just to, to piggyback on that, how do we change this at a at a larger level systemically because the, the qualifications if we don't do something, we're not going to have enough educators and specifically not educators of color. And instead of making the qualifications as difficult, how do we provide the training uh, that people who have the passion and desire, such as you folks who are on here who are qualified, but how do we take, take that training and provide that to people and then allow them to use their passion in their training to help our kids, and, and we got to change it on a on a state and a federal level, and and I'm not sure exactly how, but you know I I think you know I'm gonna open it up to you people who are a lot smarter than me. So, uh, Dr. Gaither, what what do you think on this? Can, can I just say one thing about uh, the candidates? Um, I, I in New York State we had a moratorium on the Regents' exams during uh, COVID, and I believe uh, was it was it two years in a row kids didn't have to take Regents' exams. Is that right? I'm asking a question. Is yes. that right? Okay. It's been the so, last two years, which has been a godsend. Amen. Oh, okay. But I truly yes. believe that there should be a moratorium for teachers as well for those exams. Okay. I, I believe that there should be an exemption. All right. For those exams and let the people, if they're qualified, besides all those standardized tests that they have to take in order to get their license, let them teach. Let them teach. But Logan, what do you what do you think about this? Like, how do we solve this problem? You know, I agree. Um, sorry, sorry about that, Brother Miller. But I agree one hundred percent with with Dr. Rita. One hundred percent. I think there needs to be a shift change, and not only New York, but in any other state. I think teachers should be judged on a performance level. Um, uh, the superintendent, Mr. Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell, there. I think. Teachers uh, should be screened and then come into their schools and see if they can teach and survive. And if they can, then the superintendent is the one who will accreditate them um, as a teacher, um, even though they will be going through um, particular trainings and classes. I think we should uh, get to our, our legislators and let them know that there's laws and things that should be changed. Um, I think the narrative for being a educator should change. Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, right? The, the purpose of education, mm -hmm. the purpose of education is not getting a good job. Dr. Martin Luther King wrote a full paper on this. The purpose of education is being able to think more critically mm -hmm. in the situations and the circumstances that you're in. So, you know, we, we to, to, to bring, and it goes all the way back to what you were saying, change this and bring teaching and make it sexy again. I don't think it's making it sexy again. I think it's giving people the opportunity to do the job that they can do. And if they can't do it, at least they went through a period that's proven. Put them in a situation, let them prove themselves. Every other job, every other job, except for a job that's educational, Right, except for a job that's educational, you're put in a situation where you can prove yourself. You have minimal qualifications, but then you get in that job and you must prove yourself on that job, right? Higher education, K through 12, if I'm gonna be a teacher, what happens? I have to get all of these degrees and then when I get in the class, I don't have no classroom management. So right. that's, that's my take on that. 
You, you know, and I'm, I'm going to, we're going to close out in a second. And I'm going to argue that it does have to do be with uh, sexy and attractive because something that Brent said earlier is if when, when messages get played over and over again, that's marketing and branding, right? So our, our, our rappers and our athletes too often in our communities, that's what our kids see. And that's what they aspire to is to be a rapper and an athlete because it's attractive because they think that's the quickest way to get to a point of making the money that they want to make to remove themselves from the circumstances that they're in. So that's why I kind of utilize that word of attractive or sexy because, I, you know, we have to find a way to make this attractive to want people to want to be there. But I'm going to give everybody like 60 seconds to close out. But what I'm going to ask you guys in your 60 seconds to tell us uh, like something that you, responsibility that you're personally going to take to change things for for kids of color. So what's your personal responsibility to this fight? Like, what's your dog in the fight? So um, give me like a quick 60 seconds because we got to close out. Um, and I'm going to go to, and I'm actually going to give you 30 seconds because I know we're trying to get out of here close to time. So Dr. Gaither, what's, what's your dog in the fight? How are you going to change things? Uh, we have to be intentional and we have to lead by precept and example. That's it. Drop, okay, drop the mic. Uh, I'll go with you, Dr. Beck. What's, what's... Yeah, it starts with me. Um, number one, I have to be whole. I have to be, you know, um, a lot. there's a lot of folks out there that I think need to heal. Um, so I, I need to come in, um, you know, just whole. Um, first, um, in, you know, in order to at least help and support other folks, um, um, but also it starts with my research. It starts with um, the, the, the focus of, of who I want to work with and who I want to support as well. And Brother Logan? Can't be scared to be the voice of change. You got to be that voice of change. You got to be vocal and you got to have um, an intent to, be, to, to have the courage to go out there and actually speak it. Brent? Door opener. Um, I think I, I do what I do to open doors for others. Um, I think that when you're in that situation to where someone takes a takes a, a risk on hiring you, you got to completely knock it out the box so they can hire somebody else that looks like you. And that's what I try to do every day when I go to work. Absolutely. And I think it's about giving back everybody and, uh, and you know, just closing thoughts is that um, it, you have to be that door opener. Like Brent said, I think it's my obligation to give back and to reach down and help somebody who has fallen down and give them an opportunity and a chance. And hopefully it's somebody that looks like me. And so one thing I can say to people is continue. I believe a few people said Dr. Beck led with working on yourself. So work on yourself so you can continue to put yourself in positions so you can help others. So, I, you know, I want to be in any position I can to open doors for other people and try to make sure that I'm, I'm multiplying I am putting the right people in front of our kids. Um, so I, with that being said, I'm going to turn over to our gracious host uh, of Global Minded, Carol Carter, for any closing thoughts. Thank you so much. It has been really wonderful to be with all of you today. And I hope we see you all in person in June. But I want to just uh, share two other thoughts. And I think you've addressed so many ways that we can grow that diverse talent pipeline. I also want to see us look differently at the at the way we can recruit other people because teaching like a lot of other professions there's a great you know there's been a great resignation some of those same patterns of people retiring early I think we have some amazing immigrants and refugees that when they get the English skills, they'll be those wonderful people of color, amazing leaders in front of our students showing how to overcome the odds and the things you all have done. I also think we've got to look at our retirees. I'd like to know within AARP, you know, how many different people of color are in AARP? How many of those people would be willing to teach for the next 10 years? They have so much experience. They have so much wisdom. They can be teaching about entrepreneurship. And, and I just think we need all these different, you know, avenues and um, early childhood, even getting people who, who don't have literate skills yet, but once they do get those, which they can get on their cell phone now, they can be our early childhood care providers. Then they can become teachers in a few years once they get more skills. So 
I just look at all of it and say, gosh, how can we be more innovative to get those amazing leaders in front of our, our students of color, our students who, who are poverty affected. And I, I, I just look forward to with, as Paul knows, with the Global Minded Community working with you all to just make that pool so much larger because it feels like we've gone back a few decades during um, COVID on multiple measures. And I think we've got to really have the radical collaboration to deal with that and turn it around and get going like 10X impact for that. So, so I just want to acknowledge each of you as our leaders, you know, during who we're honoring for Black History Month and would love to feature any of you all in our newsletter. Um, would be just really proud to do that. We're honoring, you know, international and amazing women in March. We're in, honoring our STEM leaders in April. Um, but it's just been really great to learn from all of you. And we just uh, really are grateful to Paul to be able to work in this space, to hold, um, hold this space for leaders like you every month so that others can really learn from, from your path and your story and your passion. So... Thanks to all of you and thanks to those of you who joined us today and Celeste will share the link with everyone so you can share out through your networks and through your districts and for those of you who are joining she'll do the same and then it'll be in our newsletter tomorrow so we can share that out um, more widely and then tomorrow is our STEM session with our African many of our African American STEM leaders so I hope you'll join us at the same time tomorrow if you can and if not that Link will also be in our newsletter. So take good care, everybody. So great to be with you all. And we hope to see everybody live June 22, 23, 24 in Denver. Thanks so much. Bye, John. Thank Thank you. You. Bye everybody. Bye.